We are excited today. Uh, we're going to continue in a teaching series called Jesus is Better, uh, but we're also uh, going to have a guest uh, come do that uh, with us, and it is my dad. Uh, my dad is uh, a missionary. Him and my mom are missionaries to Trinidad and Sebago, uh, and, and some of you uh, you know, didn't even know that that country existed until we started sending mission trips, you know, down there. But we've had many people from our church go to Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, and yes, the United States did beat them yesterday in soccer. So, um, I don't know if you knew that, but, uh, uh, right. And then we break out into USA. No, I'm just, uh, but, uh, we had, uh, uh, anyway, we've had many people from our church go down there, have, have great missions experiences, uh, get a taste of the world. Uh, Mom and dad have been in Trinidad for uh, 10 years, and, uh, and uh, before that, you know, 30 years as uh, senior pastors here in the States, so they, they bring a lot of experience uh, in ministering in the kingdom of God, and uh, what I'm excited today is that dad can help, help come and give us just this, uh, this worldview, this, this proper view of uh, of what God is doing around the earth, because we serve a really big God, right? And, uh, and, and oftentimes, uh, our experiences are so narrow uh, in comparison to what's really happening around the earth, and it'll grow our faith today, and we'll, 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 we will, I think, walk out today knowing that we serve a global God. Uh, he's the God of, of not just people here in the States, but of people all over the earth. And uh, so I want you just to dial in and, uh, and help, help me give uh, my dad, Pastor Mike Lombard, just a warm welcome here this morning. Come on. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, that's good. I like that. It's good being here. You know, we love this church. It's not just because Jordan and Lindsay are here, but we enjoy being here. Uh, we enjoy you because you love Jesus. I just want you to know that you are part of the biggest movement toward God that the world has ever seen. At the end of the New Testament, about the end of the first century, it's estimated there was one out of every 360 people on the planet were following Jesus. Today, it's estimated people that believe just like us, one in every seven people on the planet are following Jesus. That They believe Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. And one out of every three identify with the name of Jesus. But one in seven believe just like this. It's, it's incredible. In China there is approximately the same number of evangelical believers as in the United States, somewhere 80 to 100 million. God is doing some amazing things. South of the Sahara in Africa, 60% of the population are now Christians. 100 years ago, it was 1%. So you were part of something big. You come in here and gather because this is where you have relationship, but at the same time, Around the world today, around the clock, people are gathering under trees, in houses, in huge cathedrals. They're gathering in some stadiums that are amazing, 150,000 or more, and in small groups, because just like you, they love Jesus, and they're letting him lead their life. So we are part of that because we train people to go around the world. We train people to have a heart for the world and a heart for the lost. Uh, and your church has sent several people. Pastor Lori has brought two teams. Now this last team that came in March, um, on the last, one of the last days, they were in a squatter community. It was their third time there. Uh, on Sunday they may have 25, 30 people, but they were doing these, th this teaching on, um, on women who've had abuse, et cetera. And there was something like uh, 60, 70 people in the room, women who have never been in church but were looking for answers were coming. And it was your church that was making that happen. And somebody ought to put your hands together. That's really good. <laughs> and we've had others that come. You know, the Callie and Savannah have been there three times and, and uh, Morena. And on the second row over here, we have... We have Amber and Tiffany. Wave your hand. Tiffany was with us for uh, at least eight months and has been back again. And her heart is to, in Central America, to start an orphanage. So recently, within the last year or so, she went to Mexico, lived in an orphanage for several months.
to get a good understanding. And now she, she's from here in town, but she's taking Spanish to prepare herself to be able to go. And from Trinidad, some of the people we work with, they've uh, one girl's in Zambia for her sixth year, had people in Nepal going to Jordan, Colombia, in different places. When people understand the heart of God, it just changes how they live. And so that's what my, my wife and I really do. Um, she isn't here. We've had a very hard week, and so physically she's not feeling good this morning. So she will be watching this to see if I make any mistakes. <laughs> so you can check me out, Pam. And then uh, my assistant, I'd like my assistant to come up here. Put your hands together for Maddie as she comes. And stay right here because you can hand these back. Because we were just at a conference, we have some things to give away to you. Uh, ushers will have some prayer magnets that you can re help remember to pray for us. And my wife picked these up. These are our uh, lip balm. Is that right? Yeah, chapstick. And has our, our uh, name of our ministry and things on there. So you can, ushers will have those at the door. And then um, we gave some of these away. This is coconut coffee from Trinidad. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Pastor Lori. And then this is mango tea. I, only, I have very few of these left, like maybe four of each. So you have to come up to me after the service up front, and, and I'll give those out to the first ones that come, one apiece. Thank you, Maddie. It's really good to be here. And I want to pray, and in this series in Hebrews, I believe God has some incredible things to say today. And I will share some stories about some of our time in Trinidad. Father, we thank you for today. You're an incredible God. You care about us. You care about our lives. You care about this world that you created. And we're able to partner with you, not only in how we live, but how you touch your world. And it's because of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And they'll put the scripture up on the screen. I want us to read this together. Hebrews, the fourth chapter beginning at the first verse. It says this, God promised, God's promise of entering his rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. So God has something for us, and the concern is some of you might not experience it. There's something more than just coming to church, but it's partaking in what he has for us. So some of you might not experience it. For this good news that God has prepared, this, has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. So there were those who heard it and responded in their heart, yes, I believe God, and there were those who didn't. Those who didn't respond by faith didn't enter into that rest that God had for them. So that's really the, the, the key that defines the difference in these people. It isn't whether you go into a building, it isn't whether you listen to Christian music, it's whether you respond in faith to God. So, for only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my uh, my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready uh, since he made the world. So since the very beginning, he's had this plan. See, sometimes when we talk missions, we think that the New Testament has a scripture, the, the great commission to go into all the world. Listen, all that's doing is restating what was in the heart of God from the very beginning. In fact, one person said this, if you took missions out of the Bible, all you would have left is the covers, because the Bible is God's plan in his heart for the entire world to experience, as Hebrews says, entering his, his rest. Um, we know it is ready because of the place in the scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So God worked for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And he says, you know, I have a rest for you. I have a rest for you. And I'll talk about this in just a minute. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God, God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news 
failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this. God announced this through, next slide, through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, that was Joshua taking them into the promised land. If, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. The issue is really this, that God has something for us, and he's inviting us to enter into that rest. He didn't plan for us to struggle. He didn't plan for us to work hard. He didn't plan for us to live this way, trying to find peace and purpose. He said, when you come to him, there is a rest. No one describes life that way. When we talk to people in Trinidad, when I go to Hindu areas, areas that are totally Hindu, and we begin to introduce them to who Jesus is, I talk about how life is hard. You work so hard all the time, but God has a rest for people. And they're not used to this concept, but there is a rest for people. One man came to me at the end of a service and he told me this story. It was a Sunday night, we had six or 800 people there and he came to, this, came to me and he said this story. He says, I have everything I want. I have a good family, I have a great job, I have money, I have a car. I have everything that I could possibly want, but there's something missing inside. That's what this is talking about. There's something missing inside. And he says, I kept looking for what this is. He says, on a Sunday, he was in a bar. In Trinidad, we call it a rum shop. He was in a rum shop. And he's telling this story to the bartender. He's saying, you know, I've got a great life. I have a great wife and kids and a job and great house and a car. And I have money. And I'm miserable inside. And the bartender said, you need to go to church. <laughs> he said, you need God. <laughs> And he said, listen, there's a church that has a service at night and told him where it was. He went that night and he found the rest. He looked for everything else and he couldn't find it. There's a song they sing in Trinidad that says, I've searched all over and I can't find anyone. I've searched all over, but I can't find anybody like the Lord. This guy was searching for everything he could find and he couldn't find it till that night, and he realized what he was really searching for inside was God. Go to your next slide. Uh, this is my friend. Um, he, he is a devout Muslim from India, living in Trinidad. And when he was in India, he was close to a mosque, and he would go five times a day, and very devout. And we just started talking during Ramadan. He saw me and he was just excited. I didn't know why he was excited to see me, but he wanted to start talking to me. So I started asking him questions. I knew the answers to the questions, but I started asking him questions. And I said, so what do you pray for? Does God hear your prayers? Does God talk? I just asked questions like this. And he finally said this to me, he said, when I first came to Trinidad, I was praying for finances. But he says, now I'm praying for God's purpose for my life. I said, are you serious? That's what I'm praying for you, God's purpose for your life. He was so excited that I was praying for the thing he was praying for, he gave me a fist bump. And then he said, I need to know your name and your contact number, your phone number, because when I get a day off, I'm coming to your church. What? This is a devout Muslim. But even though he's a devout Muslim, he still hasn't found it in everything he's doing. That heart is searching. Just before we left to come back, I was talking to him, stopped by, let him know I was going to be gone. Ramadan had just finished, and we talked about that, and I said, so did God talk to you uh, while you were fasting during Ramadan? He laughed at me. He said, no, 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 no. I talk to you, but God doesn't talk to me. And I said to him, I am praying for God to speak to you. And he came and gave me a hug, told me I am his best friend, told me things about his family in India. And I just want you to know this man is 
is so close. And he's looking for something he cannot find. Did you know there's no other religious system which has answers to this matter of purpose? I've taken Mormon missionaries to lunch, and they come to this point that we come to the end of our life, life and we hope we've done enough good. I said, hope? Hope? Because when we respond to Jesus, the Apostle Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Muhammad Ali came to the end of his life and he says, I hope that I've done enough good to outweigh the bad. I want you to know there's no other religious system that has an answer to purpose than through Jesus. And that's what Hebrews 4 begins to tell us. There is a rest for the people of God, not through all of your work and effort to try to please God, but simply by trust. There is a rest. There is a rest. Go to the next slide. This uh, young man, oh, you, you remember him. Ah. This young man um, came to a Sunday school. The church that he is part of is 95, in the area that is 95% Hindu. There's a man in the church, his name's Popey, and Popey goes through neighborhoods. When he finds children, he talks to the parents and gets a relationship and just asks, can I bring them to Sunday school? And it's amazing how many of these parents say, sure. This young boy was 10 years old, and he was the first one in his whole village, his whole neighborhood, to respond to Jesus. An area 100% Hindu, except for this boy. And uh, I was there when he spoke with, uh, when he was talking with his dad about getting baptized. His dad, go to the next slide. We had a team, and his dad was being prayed for here. His dad said to him, listen, you know I'm Hindu, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to go all the way with him. And if you're wanting to be baptized, then I have to be there when you're baptized. So when he got baptized a year ago in the ocean, his whole family was standing at the edge of the water cheering him on. What started now a year ago a year ago, July, with his dad was now instead of coming to church, he wanted the church to come to him and he wanted to discover who this Jesus was. And so we began, he says, I want you to bring the music, I want you to bring the preacher, I want you to bring it all, just do it by my house. So we did open air services there. And we just started introducing them to who Jesus is. No, no pressure. In fact, we even had one time we did an open air that when we were done, we just opened it up for questions. One girl in her, about 21, she says, is it possible for me to follow Jesus while I'm living in a Hindu home? We talked to them of what it means to just follow Jesus and how Jesus had to come like a little child. So if a little child can follow Jesus, anybody can follow Jesus. What would be Memorial Weekend here in the States? This dad said he wanted three days of meetings by his house. The church made flyers, handed out flyers in the neighborhood. The first night, 100 people showed up. Next slide. This is one of the pictures right there. It's part of the group. Next night, there was probably 80. The next night, probably 90. Um, I want you to know now, in this neighborhood where there was one Christian boy now his family, there's at least eight members of his family who've accepted Jesus. And in the neighborhood, there's at least 20 who have responded to Jesus. The, we had a team who was just in Trinidad, and we did a service at this church. And the dad and family came to the church. He comes up to the altar, have me pray with him afterwards. And he says, I just want you to know... Um, you don't have to convince me. I don't need to go to classes. I just want you to know I'm committed. I am going to get baptized in July. And this boy now is going to have several members of his family baptized, fully following Jesus, because they have found that there is a rest that cannot be found anywhere else but with Jesus. Somebody should put your hands together for that. 
If we go on in the scripture, starting at verse 9, it says this. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. So there's a rest for the people of God. Now, it's a special rest because it's a different word for rest here. And this says, for the people of God, there's a rest. The word is actually uh, the word we would get Sabbath from. So there's a special, there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So there is something for the people of God that goes beyond just the matter of following Jesus. But there's a rest for God's people. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fail. Next, next slide. So this matter of a rest that he has for us, when we begin to follow Jesus, it doesn't mean there's no problems. It doesn't mean that life is now a vacation. We still have all the difficulties. Some places in the world are having the most horrendous persecution you could imagine. Uh, Pastor Josh alluded to some of that when he was talking earlier. But there is something that God says, for the people of God, I have a rest. Now, my life is not restful. I am incredibly busy. On Sundays when I'm back in Trinidad, I have three or four services I'm part of. Each service probably two and a half hours. So I have seven, seven and a half, eight hours in services. Uh, if I'm preaching, I'll preach in one service to a thousand people. I may go to other churches, smaller churches like the squatter community. I am busy all the time. Our first week back in July, I was just looking at it. Every day we have something going on. I'm busy trying to fit it all together. And yet God says there's a rest for us. How can life be so crazy, even as a Christian, and yet there be a rest for us? That's what I'm trying to understand with this. My friend Betro here helps us understand. Betro's from Syria, grew up in an Orthodox Christian home, baptized as a baby. God started getting a hold of his life because he realized I was baptized as a baby, but I didn't know what I was doing. He discovered that God had a rest for him. He began reading his Bible and understanding it, and something took off in his life. So he has now told me he's ready to get baptized. This is where this guy is going uh, he also makes the most amazing lamb gyros you've ever had. <laughs> so he is in the process, and without going to all the details, he's in the process of getting a visa to come to the States. His wife and daughter are in the States. His family lives in Syria. And he's in the process of getting that visa, and he needed a particular document from Syria. Well, because he had left Syria, they drafted him, and he wasn't there to go into the military, so there's a black mark on his, on his record. And they have said he cannot get that document. His parents went to the office to get this document. It's like a, it's like a, a police record. And they said, we cannot give you this because he did not serve in the military. There's that black mark. There is no way he can get it. Without this document, there's no way he can get a visa. Petro said to his mom, don't worry, just trust God. What? You need this paper. The government in Syria says you cannot have it. And if you don't get this, you will not be reunited with your wife and daughter. You won't get the visa you've been looking for for years. And he said, don't worry, mom, just trust God. That's the concept of these verses in Hebrews. There is a rest for the people of God. Just trust God. The issue is walking by faith. The issue is quit carrying the load on your own shoulders. There is a rest for the people of God. Before I finish the story, Jesus says this in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, 
let me teach you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And in Exodus, listen to this one. Moses is talking to God. He's leading these people. And as he's leading these people, sometimes they're really tough to lead. And, and God doesn't even want them to go because they're so rebellious. And the Lord says this to him, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. God says, I will personally go with you and I'll give you rest. There's something about not carrying it all on our own shoulders, but letting him carry the load. And that's what Betra was starting to understand, that there is a trust, that when we learn to trust him with our life, then God takes the responsibilities. And I want to tell you, that, honestly, this is a true story. Betra's mother went back to the office to get this document. And they told her, lady, there is no way he's gonna get this document. And she's crying like a baby and goes and gets in a taxi, taking her home. She's just bawling in the taxi. And the taxi driver says, lady, what's the problem? And she said, my son, he needs this document so he can get his visa and they won't give it to him and because of, and it explains about the military and all that. And the driver says, is that the only reason? And she said, yes. You mean he's had no criminal record? No, he had, there's nothing criminal? And she said, no. He says, okay, we're going back. This is the taxi driver. The taxi driver turns around and goes back and says, um, I'll put it this way. He says, I'm with US government intelligence. He says, we drive taxis because everybody talks in a taxi. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. He goes back, he says, you wait right here. He walks into the office and comes back. They said, in three hours, you'll have your document. This, this taxi driver, US intelligence officer, takes Betro's mom to lunch. And when they go back, he says, you wait right here, I'll go in. He goes in and when he comes out, he is waving the document. <laughs> His mom called Betro. Do you know what Betro told her? I told you to trust God. <laughs> there is a rest for the people of God. See, I think some of you may be in here, you haven't started that relationship with him. And we'll give you an opportunity at the end if that's you. But some of you, you're walking with Jesus, but you're carrying this load. You don't know how to carry it. And he says, listen, I've got a rest for you too. You don't have to carry that load. Let's go on with the scripture. Oh, there's one more slide. Did, did I get both slides there? Okay. Okay, let's go, let's go to the next one. Let's go back to the scripture now. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than, any, than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joints and the marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we're accountable. This is just amazing. See, here's the thing which is really important to understand. That the Bible is not words which come in the ear. But scripture says they're sharp, they're powerful. They're, one translation says they're living and active. They don't just go into the mind, they penetrate to the heart. And this is important. It's important to have our children memorize scripture because this word goes to work when you receive it. Jesus described it this way in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. He said this, he says, but when they understand the word, it produces a harvest. When you receive it into your life, it goes to work. You don't even have to sit there doing anything. The word goes to work in your heart and life. 
Now, you may think that's the craziest thing you've ever heard, but it is not like you are reading a book. This is living, active, powerful, the words of God himself. And when you receive those words that are spoken, whether you're reading them at home, when you hear Pastor Jordan preaching them, when you receive those words, they come in and do what they're intended to do. Isaiah says they accomplish what's intended. So when they come into your heart and life, you receive them, they start working right then. They go to work. They're active. Go to the next slide. This is, this is my friend Sona. Sona grew up in a Muslim home. In fact, every member of his extended family is Muslim. He grew up this way, except when he was a child, he went to a Presbyterian preschool. At age 67, Sona says he remembered a verse that he was taught in Presbyterian preschool. He's 67, he remembers a verse he was taught in preschool. And he asked the question, which way is right? All his life he has been taught one thing, but one verse comes back to his mind because all these years it's still working inside. It didn't go away. It was still working because it's, it's living, it's active, penetrates to the heart. It's not just up in the mind somewhere. And so he begins to pray and ask, which way is right? One day he has a vision. Jesus appears to him, takes him by the hand and walks him down to a road and there he is a fork in the road going one way and going the other. He showed him the correct way. When Sona got through with his vision, he got a Bible, began to read. Go to the next and he uh, went to a church and said, I need to get baptized. Next slide. Sona is just incredible. He is so passionate for Jesus. In fact, bandits came to his house. Uh, they actually came to a neighbor's house. The neighbors told him, told the bandits, there's nothing here. Uh, you want the house next door. Now, how would you like neighbors like that? <laughs> you need to go to my neighbor's house. So in the middle of the night, they wake him up. So as the bandits are there with guns drawn, Sona is talking to one of them about the Lord, about the need for Jesus. You know, you don't have to keep doing this. He, in the words we're talking about today, he's saying, listen, God has a rest for you. The guy's saying, listen, I don't have any other way. I don't know what to do. He says, Jesus. Two weeks later, that bandit was dead. But Sona was talking to him about Jesus because he understands that there is something powerful about God's word touching a life. There's something powerful about the rest that God has. I want to conclude because there is discovering a boldness in prayer that comes from these, this last scripture. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours, talking about Jesus, understands our weaknesses, for he has faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we'll receive mercy and we'll find grace to help when we need it most. I think that we often don't understand some of the benefits of following Jesus. These verses tell us one of the benefits of following Jesus is we can come boldly into the throne room of God to ask for help. I think we don't understand that. Most Christians, they want the pastor to pray or an intercessor to pray when they have a need. I had a guy tell me one time, he was a supervisor, he was in the Phoenix area, he told me this. He says, anytime he needed prayer, he wanted to call me to pray because he believed I had a better connection with God. And he wanted to wait till I was in the church office because if I was in the church office, he felt it was probably a little bit better connection yet. 
But people just don't understand that when you belong to Jesus, you can come boldly into his presence. My, uh, my daughter Ashley is watching right now and uh, two of my grandchildren. When, when Ashley was uh, growing up in our church, she brought one of her friends and went to my office. And as they went to my office, the pastor's office, she opened the door and walked in and her friend says, oh, you're walking into pastor's office? And she says, no, I'm not. I'm walking into my dad's office. She went over and sat behind my desk and her friend is having a real problem. You're sitting behind pastor's desk. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm sitting behind my dad's desk. She went through the drawers because she knew I had some candies in there. <laughs> and she found the candies, and her friend is going crazy. You're getting into pastor's desk, and you're getting his candies. And she says, no, I'm not. It's my dad's candies. And then she was ready for something to drink, and she knew another drawer had change in there, and she wanted to get change so she could go get something to drink. So she reaches in to get some money, and her friend has just lost it. You're taking pastor's money! And she says, no, I'm not. It's my dad's money. She had an understanding of who she was in relationship to me. And this is the understanding that we have in these verses. When we come to God through Jesus, we now have access to the very throne room of God. You don't have to have somebody else go on your behalf. You can come boldly. You don't have to come sheepishly. You don't have to come apologetically. You know, I, I'm, I don't usually do this, God. I just, you know, I don't know what. You can come right in like my daughter did. This is not just the king of the universe. It's my heavenly father. I can walk boldly. The next slide. This guy lives at our house. He's been a Christian for five years. His name's Azam. Azam is uh, first Christian in his family. Uh, his entire extended family is Muslim. And five years ago, he gave his life to Jesus. And in fact, his great grandfather started some of the the Muslim movements in Trinidad. But Azam has this feeling that if, if it says it in the word, then it must be true. And he has this idea that if I belong to God, then God is now my father. He's my daddy. And you will often hear him talk in ways you don't typically hear people talk in church. He'll pray and he'll just talk to daddy because it's very personal for him. He just believes if I talk to him, he's gonna hear me. Some of the things he would say are just amazing. I never hear Christians pray this way. He doesn't know any different. This is all new to him. He just takes the word and reads it, puts it into practice and says, it's gonna work because it says it right there. I've prayed and God told me to do this and this is how he lives. So he believes he can just come boldly before God. So he was out to eat with his family, and I believe it was for a birthday, and they were at a particular restaurant, and the manager of the restaurant had come by the table to inquire if everything was okay. He noticed that it appeared that she was in pain. And so he got up from the table and he went to her and he, he just inquired, you look like you're in pain, and she explained what was going on. He just asked, would you mind if I pray for you? And she said yes. He prayed for her, and the pain left just like that, in a restaurant. She comes back to the table. His Muslim family suddenly hears a story they didn't know what to do with. He prayed a prayer, and Jesus healed the manager in the restaurant because their son simply believed he had boldness to go into the very throne room of God and God would hear him. God has a rest for you today. You don't have to search all over to try to find 
fulfillment and purpose and meaning. You don't have to find it in jobs and money and houses and family. You could find it in Jesus. There is a rest for you. For some of you, you're following Jesus, but you're carrying a load he never intended you to carry. You're a Christian, but you're carrying a load. He wants to take that load. And he wants to teach you how to just trust him. Some of you just need to understand that his word is so powerful that as you receive it into your life, you don't understand, but the word says to trust him. And as you take that word and receive it into your life, suddenly you you find yourself trusting God in ways you haven't trusted before. His word is living and active and powerful. And some of you need to receive his word into your life. And then some of us need to take a step of faith in prayer. Azam stretches me all the time. His simple faith, he just believes. And he believes he doesn't have to go to anybody else, but he can just go to God himself because it's his daddy. And so he goes to him and he just prays and he hears from God. It's an amazing experience. Do you understand that the way we often view church and Christianity isn't exactly the way God has intended it? He has more for us. And this is what we begin finding is that people that just yield their life to him, they begin to experience something that they hadn't even known was there. In just a minute, we're going to pray, and I'm going to pray for two things before the worship team leads us. The first is, you may be here. Maybe you're just here visiting or maybe you've been coming for some time, but you know you don't have relationship with God. And it's one of the simplest things. If a child can follow him, you can follow him. If that one 10-year-old boy can follow him, you can follow him. And you have been looking for answers in all the wrong places. And today, God says, I have a rest for you. So in a minute as we pray, I'm going to pause. And if that's you, I just want to pray for you today that God will come in, forgive your sins, remove the load, and let you follow him the rest of your life. Some of you in here, you've already followed Jesus, but you're carrying a load he never intended you to carry. It's hard for me to understand my friend Betro's confidence when he talked to his mom and said, don't worry, just trust God. And I hear those words, the Lord speaking to you. There is a rest for the people of God. Don't worry, just trust God. Some of you in here need to trust him. Before you walk out of here, you need to, you need to unload some of this. Scripture tells us to cast all our cares on him because he cares for you. So we're gonna pray for some of you that today be the first time you give your life to him, you experience his rest. And we wanna pray for some of you that are here, you're carrying a load God never intended you to carry. And he wants to take that load and carry it for you. Would you bow your head so we can pray? Father, we come before you because you are king of the universe. You're doing things that we have never seen or understood because you're just God. You work in places, people say, it's not even possible for that to happen. And you say, that's okay, I'm king of the universe. I can do anything I want. You open doors where there's no doors. You break through where there's no way to break through. You provide answers where there's no answers. And so Father, today again, we come before you because we need that kind of a God to work in our lives. So if you're here and you're saying, today's the day I need to give my life to God. I've never entered that rest and I need to enter that rest. Well, everyone's just praying. If that's you, just raise your hand and I wanna pray with you. Is there anyone in here? I've got one hand, anyone else? Two hands, anyone else? Three, anyone else? I've got four or five hands, anyone else?
I think this is important, so I just want the whole church to just join us in a prayer. And it's just simple. Scripture tells us we believe in our heart and confess it with our mouth, we're saved. So I just want to lead us in a simple prayer. And if this expresses your heart, then Scripture tells us in Romans that you're saved. So church, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I need your rest. I've looked, I've looked for peace and purpose in all kinds of places. But today I'm turning to you. Receive me today. Show me purpose. Show me meaning. Forgive me for my sins. I want heaven to be my home. And I want to be part of your family. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Secondly, I want to pray for those who are just carrying a load you shouldn't be carrying. So just bow your heads again. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just bring people to you. You tell us you have a rest for us, and some of us who are following you are just carrying a load bigger than we can possibly carry. And in the next few minutes, I just pray that you would lift that load in a way only you could do. If that's you, you're carrying a load bigger than you're supposed to carry, just raise your hand, and we want to pray. It doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, I'm seeing those hands going up. Anybody else? I'm carrying a load bigger than I should carry. Anyone else? In the name of Jesus right now, Jesus, you said your load was easy. You said for us to come and learn from you. And in the name of Jesus right now, I just pray the load that we are carrying would lift off of our shoulders before we walk out of here. Even before things change, may we learn to trust you in ways we've never trusted you before. And we just say, come Holy Spirit, let your strength and your power and your courage and your hope fill our heart right now. Let your strength and your power and your courage and your hope fill us right now. Carry that load for us. Teach us to trust you like my friend Betro. So right now we cast that load on you. Teach us to walk in your rest. In the name of Jesus, amen. Those of you, five or six of you that prayed because you wanted to follow Jesus today, before you leave, find one of the pastors, one of the leaders and talk with them. Let them pray with you personally before you walk out of here. I want you to have the strength and support from people in the church.